Hello again, welcome to ASPE Strategic Visions 2020. Uh, it's certainly a, a much more dangerous world that we live in. The Prime Minister Scott Morrison has, has said as much. He says that we are living in a poorer, more disordered and more dangerous world. And that was reflected in our recent uh, defence update, um, which has certainly located the challenges for Australia, the challenges for this region, a very blunt assessment that conflict in the Indo-Pacific region um, is still a possibility, perhaps a rising possibility as well, and that Australia needs to be prepared for this. There is so much to discuss when you look at the state of our world today, but clearly the relationship between China and the United States is front and centre and where that places Australia, where that places Australia between its strategic alliance with the US and of course our biggest trading partner uh, in China. Um, discuss all of this today in one of the most eagerly anticipated uh, sessions that we've had in Strategic Visions is the Defence Minister Linda Reynolds. It's nice to have you with us. Uh, good afternoon, Stan, and it's wonderful to be with you. And uh, thanks to ASPE. I love my engagement over many years now with ASPE, and it's a credit uh, to you and to them that you're able to uh, deliver this really important series of discussions on issues of strategic importance. So congratulations and thank you. Yeah, and look, it, it's, a, it's a sign of the times, the way that we're doing this, of course, over the web. But to add to that, you're also um, going through your own isolation after having returned from the United States. I, sh I should start with that. How has that been for you? I mean, you're experiencing something that so many Australians are having to experience right now themselves. Look, Stan, I'm remarkably fortunate. I'm going through uh, ACT government supervised quarantine. I'm on day eight. But I've been very fortunate that Defence have been able to uh, establish uh, the systems uh, that I need at home to continue doing my job as the Minister for Defence. So day eight, and like many Australians, I'm very eagerly looking forward uh, to the next uh, few days and, and uh, getting home to Perth. Mm. Okay, look, I thought I wanted to start because you, your background and what you bring to this job is um, is interesting and, and unique, uh, your own military background. I wanted to start with that. Uh, what do you bring from your experience in the military, um, your own personal background to the job, and how that has shaped your worldview? Well, Stan, that's an interesting question. And I guess I'd start off by saying, you know, I, like everybody, is uh, defined and shaped by the sum of our life experiences. And to understand my background and what I bring to this job, I think uh, provides some degree of clarity in terms of the approach uh, that I've taken with Defence over the past 12 months and where we're heading uh, from here. I bring three different apertures to Defence. Uh, first of all, my military background, mm. my political background and also my industry background, in particular to Defence industry. Most commentators have focused on the fact that I spent nearly 30 years in the Army Reserves, which is quite obvious. But the point I would make... And, and, and we have to say at a, at a very senior level. It, it has, and it's not just the facts uh, that I've been in the Army, but it's really the jobs that I've done and the experience that I've had uh, that has brought me to, to this point. Uh, Army, uh, like all services, teach you from a very young age how to lead, to manage, to organise, how to uh, deliver three potential ways of delivering an outcome. But most importantly, I think it teaches you how to make decisions so that has been very helpful in politics and certainly very helpful in this job. But I think the experiences that I've had that have been most relevant uh, and use certainly over the past 12 months is the fact that at Army Headquarters, I, uh, as a colonel and as a brigadier, I did three large change programs, uh, enterprise-wide uh, programs uh, for Army, and that really taught me a lot about the beast that is the Defence uh, Department and the Defence Enterprise, but it also showed me how change can be successfully done within Defence. And then uh, the 12 months that I did at the Australian Defence College doing a Master's of Strategic Studies also provided me with a great understanding of our geostrategic circumstances. But uh, interestingly, I did my Master's dissertation on uh, Defence Reform so I had the luxury of spending 12 months uh, going back into the history of the Defence Department and why it has uh, systematically for over 100 years failed uh, to deliver uh, on uh, government's expectations uh, of the enterprise. Uh, so it, that has been very, very helpful background and insight into the department today. So what that background, sort of the combination of that background, 
allowed me to do was to really hit the ground running uh, when I just over 12 months ago when I became Minister for Defence. Uh, I just over 12 months ago at the ADFA uh, Lecture Theatre, I addressed all of the Se Defence and Senior Leadership Group and I provided them three very uh, clear but I think very powerful objectives uh, and that is strategy, capability and also reform. So since that time, uh, with those guiding priorities in mind, uh, the department uh, and the ADF got to work and we have been incredibly busy. Uh, I was very proud to return to the same auditorium just 12 months later with the Prime Minister and deliver on the first two of those three priorities. So strategy in the mm. Defence Strategic Update and also capability in the force structure plan. Uh, now we are turning our attention to reform because uh, as we all know, it's uh, great having a plan, but if you don't have the money and money, the financial stability, but also a plan to enable the organisation to deliver it, uh, the strategy just ends up being a piece of a piece of paper. So both of those documents are significantly reshaping uh, our defence strategy and our approach to our changes uh, in our geostrategic circumstances. And when we talk about those geostrategic circumstances, I want to get your overview on how you see this moment. We heard from the Prime Minister on, on that day, actually, describing the world as particularly with coronavirus, um, as being poorer, more dangerous and more disordered. And uh, part of this strategic update was aimed very much at trying to position Australia at a time of rising tension between the two big powers, China and the United States. What is this moment that we are living through strategically? How would you characterise it? Well, my job Stan, ultimately, is about seeing the world uh, as it really is and not as we would still hope or wish it still was. And there is no doubt whatsoever that this Australia's strategic environment is deteriorating uh, and not for the better. Uh, this is not necessarily a cause for alarm, but it certainly is a call to action uh, for, for our nation. Since the release of the 2016 White Paper, uh, the trends uh, that we foreshadowed in that white paper have come upon us far more quickly than we anticipated uh, in 2016. Uh, the militarisation of the region, uh, the militarisation of disputed features, uh, the technological disruption and the adoption of those new technologies uh, in military weapon systems, uh, the rise of uh, grey zone uh, tactics and you know, hybrid warfare, all of those, that includes things like cyber, uh, cyber attacks, uh, foreign interference, and the list goes on and on. So our, our circumstances pre-COVID were already deteriorating and changing quite significantly. But as we're now seeing, COVID is certainly uh, exacerbating uh, those, that instability. Uh, Pre-COVID, we had an environment where our institutions and our patterns of cooperation uh, that have benefited and underpinned our peace and prosperity since World War II uh, were being progressively undermined, and the Prime Minister has talked about that at some length. And all of those trends are clearly being exacerbated by COVID-19. And, and to the extent that COVID-19, we'll get to some of the, the ways in which it is exacerbating those tensions, accelerating some of the, the issues that were already there. Um, just directly, when it comes to COVID, we know that we are going into great debt having to deal with this. We are in recession and the world and some, by some measurements is, is in a depression. How will, given the significant increase in defence spending outlined in the update, how is it going to be possible to meet those objectives in an environment where we don't know how deep this recession slash depression is going to be, where the growth is going to come from when we come out the other side of COVID and what it looks like at the other side? How do we maintain those projections and that level of funding in this environment? Mm -hmm. Well, Stan, when we when I went into the National Security Committee, uh, we had done a lot of work within Defence pre-COVID uh, to articulate what we saw our strategic environment was and what we needed to do uh, for our nation's defence. Uh, and we also, as you know, put the plan around that uh, in terms of enhancing Army, Air Force and Navy capabilities but also creating two new military domains, and that is cyber and space. 
So we put the hard work into those documents and into the arguments at the NSC. And there was a unanimous agreement that despite our current fiscal circumstances, this expenditure in military capability over the next decade was essential. It was not just essential for certainty for defence planning, because a lot of these projects you know, go over many decades, but it was also incredibly important for Australian industry. Because in 2016, when we uh, announced the white paper, we acknowledged that uh, defence industry, particularly our sovereign defence industry, was a fundamental, what we call a fundamental input to capability. So over the last four years, we have been progressively integrating and uh, we have come to this realisation, uh, Defence has somewhat belatedly, I'd argue, that Australian industry is far more capable than we had previously given it credit for. So now we have about 15,000 companies in our supply chain uh, in Australia and at least 70,000 workers, and that number is growing even during COVID. So with the Defence budget, which is, you know, which is uh, going from about $45 billion uh, through to over you know, 75 million mm. over the next decade. A third of that uh, goes to Australian salaries, so for our defence personnel, contractors and our men and women in uniform. Uh, a third of that goes roughly into sustainment, the vast majority of which is done in Australia and increasingly in our regions. And over that decade, expenditure balance is going from 30% into new capabilities to 40%. And we are unashamedly increasing the Australian industry content. So a lot of that money uh, is staying in Australia and it is sustaining uh, at the moment over 70,000 jobs, which will increase uh, exponentially over the decade. So mm -hmm. we have very deliberately focused that expenditure and also that investment in Australian industry. And Stan, don't forget, these are the jobs of the future. These mm. are, you know, the majority of them are at the cutting edge of technology, both in terms of trades uh, and professions. So these jobs and these programs, uh, like the maritime programs, we have multi-generations of jobs that are now secured. So uh, people who are working on our shipbuilding programs today, their great-great-grandchildren will also have the opportunity to work in these industries. Mm. So it is important economic stimulus. Uh, before we get to the, the broader sort of geopolitical strategic part of this, you did mention that the third element is reform, and that's still to come. But what areas are you looking at? What what type of reform is necessary, particularly as we try to to pivot and deal with what is a much more, you know, much more critical, vulnerable, and high stakes environment now. Mm -hmm. Well, Stan, that's really at the heart of what myself, uh, the Secretary and our new Associate Secretary, Catherine Drones, are working on. Because again, we've got the right plan, we've got the right capability plan, but we don't have an organisation that is yet uh, adaptable enough uh, to actually deliver, uh, to not only to procure uh, sort of over 400 separate capability programs uh, to integrate that into the force in being, but we need the backbone, as in the defence organisation itself, to transform, to deliver these capabilities. Uh, that has been a perennial problem, you know, for over a century for defence, is to actually be completely synchronised uh, with defence capability. So uh, we've got a very large defence organisation, uh, which is quite, it is better than it used to be under our full structure plan process, but there is a lot of work to be done to continually transform the organisation to keep up with technological change and disruption, but also to ensure that we can keep delivering what we need to. Now, you mentioned the changing landscape between 2016 yeah. white paper and, the, and the, the strategy update. If one significant factor has changed, it is China and China being much more assertive, not just in the South China Sea, there are tensions along the border with India, um, there are increasing tensions and warnings from mainland China uh, to Taiwan uh, around any potential move towards independence. We're seeing the actions in Hong Kong as well. To what extent, and I know that the government has been very careful in trying to avoid explicitly framing this about China, but to what extent is this update and, and the need for us to, uh, to position ourselves in this much more volatile environment about specifically about China and China's place in the world? 
Well, Stan, as I've said and the Prime Minister has said, this is not, this is genuinely not about one specific nation. Uh, I've also made the point a number of times is that Australia as a people and as a nation, we have not changed. You know, over the last few years, we are still the same people that we've always been. We have a great respect for democracy, for sovereignty, for individual freedoms, uh, and also for the respect the sovereignty of you know, other regional neighbours, uh, whether you know, be, they be large or small. So that's the first point. We haven't changed. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, uh, a lot of the uh, strategic uh, factors in our region have changed and it is becoming more unstable. We are calling out, uh, and, you know, the Foreign Minister and the Prime Minister mm. has called out very clearly what we see as very bad behaviour. And as you listed off a number of those in Hong Kong with the Uyghurs, uh, with uh, militarising disputed features. So we are calling out that behaviour, but we have always made it clear that we welcome China playing a role as a responsible regional partner. And where we do not see that occurring, we will absolutely keep calling, keep calling that out, and we are. Overall, would you say that, uh, that China is behaving like a reasonable, responsible global citizen? Well, I think we've highlighted a number of areas where we don't think that they are, and we have called on them to abide by international law uh, and also to respect the sovereignty of all other nations uh, in our region and more widely. Uh, China is not the only nation whose behaviour you know, other nations and other friends have been calling out as well. So it is important that we, and this is at the heart of this strategy, the shaping effect in our uh, defence strategic update, is that we work very hard with regional partners and also global partners in new ways uh, to encourage a respect for sovereignty uh, and the conditions which will enable us all to recover quicker from COVID-19, and that is adherence to international law. Well, the United States... Um has certainly ramped up the rhetoric towards China and is very specific in, in declaring China, as it did in 2017, as a strategic competitor. Um, there has been a real shift, particularly this year. Given our close relationship with the United States, has that put extra pressure on Australia, given the, the much more muscular approach we're seeing out of the US and the comments of, of people like uh, like Pompeo, for instance? No, look, um, absolutely it has, it has not. Um, and as you know, I've just come back uh, mm. from the United States and from the 30th Osmin Dialogue, uh, which is why I'm uh, in quarantine at the moment. Uh, that was, uh, it was the right decision to go in person and to have uh, these meetings over two days face-to-face -face with both my counterpart, uh, Secretary Mark Esper, and that was about our 10th uh, in-person uh, exchange over the last few months, and also with Mike Pompeo and the Foreign Minister. It was a great opportunity not only to get uh, very strategic outcomes and important strategic outcomes for Australia, which we did, uh, but the discussions that we were able to have, as I said, over many meetings and meals uh, provided us an opportunity for us to share with the United States our perspective on our region, our perspective on their relationship with China uh, and also uh, you know, COVID-19, uh, our respective responses. So the discussions were very rich, they were very frank, but it is very clear that the United States respects that we do have in a number of areas differences of opinion. Uh, you could see that at our press conference that, you know, we share so much together and our alliance is in incredibly good shape, but we do have different perspectives and, you know, that's as I think Australians would expect it to be. What are the expectations of the United States, though, from the Australian alliance. One of the areas um, highlighted is the South China Sea and freedom of navigation operations. Could you foresee circumstances where Australia would join with the United States directly in those operations? Well, it was certainly something we discussed, uh, not just in terms of freedom of navigation, uh, but we also did discuss the recent transits that Australian, the Australian Navy uh, has done and some of the other exercises that uh, we have been participating in. We have done transits. We did one uh, earlier this month uh, on the way. We did a pa joint passage with the United States and Japan through the Philippine Sea. So we are doing it, but, again, we're doing it in a way that meets our, nation our nation's interests. We do things together, and we do them, but we don't always have to do them identically, and the United States is very comfortable with that. <laughs> 
when you look at the South China Sea, how great do you see that? How much of a flashpoint is that right now, given how important it is to trade? I think about it. A third of global trade passes through there. China has ignored the ruling of The Hague in, in, uh, in claiming those disputed islands, um, enlarging them, militarising them. Yeah. How great a threat is the tension in that part of the world right now? Well, look, the risk for miscalculation uh, obviously exists, uh, which is why when we do either unilateral, bilateral or multilateral transits through the region, uh, we do so in accordance with international law and we do so because it is in our nation's interest to do so. As you said, uh, a large part of our, our trade goes through the region. So it is very important that we do freedom of navigation, uh, well, pass safe passage, I should say, mm. and also free, you know, overflights uh, through the region. Uh, we, we don't have to, as I said, we don't have to do it identically with other nations, uh, but it is important that we, we do that and we are continuing to do so even uh, during COVID-19. How, how do you characterise the tensions around Taiwan at the moment? Um, we've certainly seen um, a change in the rhetoric from China. They've dropped the word peaceful reunification. The word peaceful is gone. Um, there have been warnings directly to Taiwan about any moves towards independence. And, of course, any potential conflict there would drag the United States in. And I'm interested to know about where Australia may sit in that, in that as well. How do you characterise those tensions? Well, Stan, it was something that we did discuss, as you'd expect, at Osmin, and, in fact, our discussions are reflected in our joint statement. It is safe to say, I think, from our perspective, that the change in China's posture uh, on Taiwan will do nothing to de-escalate tensions in the region and are uh, fueling increased tensions. And, again, we would call on China and all other nations, including North Korea, who are also quite destabilising in, in North Asia at the moment, to abide by international law and to look to de-escalate tensions. And this is certainly something that we are watching very closely. Would any potential conflict there inevitably, would inevitably involve Australia because of the ANZUS Treaty? Just how, just what is expected of us in that circumstance? Is, would it be to consult or would it be to actually be directly involved? Well, Stan, we haven't got to that. We certainly haven't, you know, escalated to that point yet where we've had to have those discussions. But clearly, if uh, it did escalate further, we would have to have those discussions. But again, we would do so uh, in, in a, from a frame of reference for our own national interest. How much more dangerous is the region right now? I mean, the, um, you know, the, the Indo-Pacific uh, it's seen as being still potentially low, but increasingly risky. What is what is the potential for, for the type of conflict, given that we're seeing these, these tensions, particularly between the, the two big powers? Well, Stan, the answer to that can be seen, I think, in the Defence Strategic Updates. Uh, in the white paper, we had three equally weighted objectives for defence, which was our uh, homeland defence, regional defence and global defence, and they were equally weighted. We no longer have that, uh, that luxury. So in the Defence Strategic Update, we have refocused our objectives for defence into three new effects-based objectives. Uh, the first one is to shape. Uh, so we've got shaping, deterring and responding. Now, shaping is all about working with our region uh, to lock in our uh, shared, uh, shared visions for the region, for peace, for prosperity, and also to encourage uh, respect for sovereignty which is really an enhancement of what we've been doing with ASEAN for a long time and also in the Pacific Step Up. But we are increasing the partners in that, so we're working more closely than ever with Indonesia, with Japan and India, because we are all democracies who share the same values. Uh, so that has been very you know, important for us. Uh, but COVID-19 is and the economic impacts that it is having on regions, you know, nations in our region is certainly exacerbating that. When it comes to, you look at the, the update, part of it is to project our power as well and yes. a lot a lot of mention of a US-led um, alliance but also for Australia to be independent as well. How do we balance that at the moment, the expectations of a US-led alliance but also that independence, the capacity to project Australian power? Look, Stan, the United States since World War II has really underpinned uh, 
peace and prosperity in our region, in particularly in the Pacific, and it continues to do so. And we've always, uh, and, and they are still our key strategic partner in, in the region. But it is, and I saw that again at Osmin, it is, it is a partnership uh, and they do respect the role that we play in our region and they do listen to uh, our point of view and uh, sometimes to, to, to our advice. So how we're changing our regional architecture, so uh, in terms of, and it's not just with us, uh, the English and the French uh, and the Germans are also looking, for example, at their current relationships in the region and how we can better coordinate them uh, together to actually support, as I said, peace and prosperity. Because one of the things that uh, is utmost in my mind is that we've got a health-induced economic crisis globally and in our region, which, which is the first pillar of a stable democracy. And at the same time, we've also got, um, you know, security uh, instability as well. And those are the two pillars of democracies and they are both under attack at the same time in our region. So we, we Australia has a great responsibility, I think, to support both. Given that the tensions we've talked about, um, is it still possible to say that Australia does not have to choose? That old line that we don't have to choose between our strategic relationship with the US or our trade relationship with China, is that becoming increasingly more difficult? not just because of, 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 uh, of the tensions, but also because of China's reaction to decisions that we make that have a real cost, and we've seen that. Well, Stan, it is, it is certainly true to say that it is becoming more complex uh, in managing both relationships, but it has never been a choice. Now, as I said up front, we still welcome our engagement with China. We have uh, dealt with differences in our relationship with China now for many decades. And it is a mutually economically important relationship, but we are two completely separate nations in terms of uh, our, our systems of governments and in terms of you know, who we are as people. So we don't have to choose and we are working very hard uh, not to choose. And, you know, the United States is not making us, is not asking us to choose. Uh, we, we are managing both, I think, very effectively in quite a uh, challenging environment. Well, I just want to get your thoughts on, on something that Mike Pompeo said recently as well, where he talked about Australia, the, the, the sort of global multilateral institutions and wondering whether, in fact, they are can still fit for purpose and believing that, he says, they're not shaped right for this current confrontation vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Do you share the concern about the health of those institutions and the strength of alliances right now? Uh, to a degree, yes. And uh, Prime Minister Morrison has spoken about this at some length uh, in, before COVID-19. And I think that any, any institutional framework needs to be regularly assessed to make sure that it's, it stays fit for purpose uh, as life and societies uh, move on. And these organisations work and they've worked very well for many decades after World War II, both uh, in terms of strategic alliances uh, and multilateral forums and also uh, economic, but they only work if everyone plays by the rules. Uh, so there is a strong case, and again, Prime Minister Morrison has articulated that very well, that it is time uh, for, for us to review those frameworks to make sure they are fit for purpose for the world that we live in today and not the past uh, that is not coming back. And one of the questions that we had coming in here before, which um, does go to this, is Australia's place then in the world as a, as a middle power and whether there is a, a, a grand strategy, if you like, a broader strategy about where Australia positions itself. We've talked about the defence strategic update, but there are other aspects, of, you know, foreign policy update, a strategic uh, update or other areas where we may look at developing a a grander strategy about where Australia's place is in the world, its interests, how it can use its position in the world at this, at this time? Well, Stan, I think it's very clear to me in the defence and the national security space is we are very confident and we're very comfortable in where we sit uh, in the world today. And it's, it's been quite a, quite a, in some ways, a revelation to me in this job over the past sort of 15 months is just to see really how valued Australia's contribution is 
uh, across uh, security, economic and uh, development forums. People do respect our voice. They do listen to us. And that is uh, the case now in, in terms of defence. Uh, I've been invited uh, to participate in NATO defence ministers meeting uh, for the first time uh, out of operational meetings. And they are very, very interested in our perspective on our region because uh, NATO, as the EU, understands that the strategic shift uh, has moved uh, and is moving away from the North Atlantic uh, to the, particularly to the Pacific, but also to the Indian Ocean. And mm. that's, that's our home. A theme that has sort of emerged in a lot of the conversations we've been having, particularly when you talk about NATO and you talk about Europe, is not just China, but Russia. Do you see a greater convergence of interest between those two powers and what that may represent in terms of a, a strategic threat or strategic challenge and how that indeed is met? I think it's, it is fair to say that we, NATO and other nations, have seen uh, a convergence of military activities uh, like joint exercise in the Baltics uh, and in North Asia, that there has been a convergence of uh, cooperation between mm. the two nations. Uh, what that actually means and the implications, I think, are not yet clear, but certainly they are working together uh, more, uh, not just in our region but also uh, in in Russia's traditional backyard. Well, it also extends to the Middle East too. We've seen Iran, China and Russia carry out their own military exercises as well as they did towards the end of last year. Yes, they have. And that is something that we uh, and our other like-minded uh, friends are looking at very closely. Let's turn to, to the Pacific uh, as well. We're clearly, um, you know, it's Australia's backyard and Australia has been involved um, in numerous, numerous interventions and the use of our military in the region. How great do you see the, the challenge right now of China's increasing influence throughout the Pacific? We've already seen a couple of nations change their, their diplomatic recognition, for instance, from Taiwan to, to the China mainland. We've heard talk of potentially China trying to establish uh, a base yeah. in, the, in the Pacific as well. How great a threat right now is that? Well, Stan, I'd characterise it slightly differently, is Australia is very consistent with, in, whether it's China or any other nation, is we encourage and we expect any nation uh, operating or working in our region to do so as respectful uh, international partners and players. So we welcome uh, any, any contributions from China or any other nation uh, in our region that respects sovereignty, that does not create debt traps, uh, that doesn't become intimidation or something worse. So where, where the behaviours are well-intentioned and in line with international law and sovereignty, we welcome them. But again, we have seen over recent years uh, behaviours that are not in accordance with that. And again, that comes down to the heart of our shaping strategy is encouraging uh, the behaviours uh, that we all want to see in our region. Um, you know, China would also say that it has a right to extend its its influence in the region as well. It is spending more money in the Pacific. It's building infrastructure in Pacific islands, establishing person-to-person -person contacts as well, educational contacts uh, uh, as well with those with those countries. Does that is is it a spending war now? How could we compete potentially with China if China really wanted to ramp up? It's spending in the region. We're still the biggest aid donor, but, but how does that landscape look? Well, again, Stan, it's not about Australia competing with uh, you know any other nation, who you know, and there are many nations who do uh, have a lot of positive uh, influence and impact in you know in, right across our region, uh, particularly across the Pacific. As I said, you know, France in particular. So it is all about how you do it. And uh, we welcome any support, you know, from any nation that is done in accordance with international law, that is done, as I've said, you know, that respects that nation's sovereignty and is there to capacity build in a respectful way. We welcome that from any country, but that is not what we have seen in recent times. Is, is there a need for an increase of, a, of soft power, Australia's soft power in the region? Um, you know, speaking as someone who, who works in the media, is there a need for a greater voice, a greater media voice, a greater investment in that voice? Um, the use, the value of television, radio, multi-platform media to, to, 
to speak to the region um, to extend Australia's soft power and voice in the region? Uh, in short, yes, and Stan, that's really what the uh, Pacific Step Up program uh, that this government initiated almost two years ago now, because we did realise that we had had our focus sort of elsewhere across the globe for for a long time, and it was important that we focused, you know, refocused our efforts both in terms of defence cooperation and also our people to people engagements and our development uh, development work and efforts. So we have significantly increased that uh, in partnership with our regional uh, regional friends, and it's you know in terms of defence cooperation in my area, uh, even during COVID we have had our defence cooperation staff and our programs uh, still running. We're building infrastructure, but we're building sovereign infrastructure uh, that countries like Papua New Guinea and Fiji and others actually request and they actually need. So for us, it's about capacity building in terms of uh, sovereign defence capability, and also defence is now being uh, defence cooperation programs are being used uh, to provide COVID nineteen support for uh, military and police forces in our region, PPE, uh, you know, training on the health training and those sorts of things. So, in short, the answer is yes, and but we do it not to seek influence, but we do it because we're good friends and because we want to continue with a secure and stable region. And a lot of comments and questions coming in as well about um, uh, uh, about the, the, our, our region in Southeast Asia, connections there, particularly with Indonesia. Um, we've discussed throughout the Strategic Visions um, series the, the Indonesia-Australia relationship, which at times is fraught, often appears to be driven more by crisis than any real depth of of, uh, of, of ties. When it comes to the military, what about prospects for more direct engagement there with Indonesia? Look, uh, Indonesia is, I think our defence to defence relationship with Indonesia is the strongest it has probably ever been. Uh, I talk regularly with Minister Prabowo and before COVID, uh, Minister, Price, uh, Minister Payne and I went uh, to Indonesia and had a two plus two. Uh, our relationship is in very good health. We are looking at uh, additional activities and exercises we can do together. And I'm also working with uh, Minister Prabowo and Minister Singh from India on how we can do uh, some new trilateral maritime activities in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so in Indonesia is very important. It is a very large and a democracy and a nation that does share democratic values and is also very keen to see regional peace and prosperity. So Indonesia is increasingly, it's always been a great friend, uh, but our defence relationship is going from strength to strength. We also had uh, Sir Rabbi Namibu, the former Prime Minister of PNG, on and discussing um, the, the, the tensions that exist there and the competition between China and Australia, which has played out directly there. One of the issues we talked about was, was the proposed Manus base as well. Has there, do things need to be accelerated? Are you concerned about some of the, 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 uh, the, the criticisms and questions that have come out, some of the resistance to that base, particularly from the governor there, um, coming out of Papua New Guinea? Look, the defence relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea, I think, is as strong as it's ever been. Uh, under our defence, it is our largest defence cooperation program, and at the moment we've got over 30 defence personnel working hand in glove with the Papua New Guinea Defence Forces. Uh, I spent a week, nearly a week up there. I think it was the first trip I did as Minister for Defence. Uh, I speak regularly with my counterpart, as does the Chief of Defence Force. So we do programs, uh, so our Defence Corporation program, including uh, the facility that we're looking uh, to do in, in partnership with Papua New Guinea, is at their request. It is a sovereign PNG uh, facility that we're, we're looking to build. Uh, I, I totally understand uh, some of the local issues that uh, you, you discuss, but ultimately they are issues for the Papua New Guinean government to work through with uh, the governor of, of Manus. So, you know, it's, it's been two years now. Do you see this being accelerated in the, in the near future? Well, it is. The standard is progressing, but we're also making sure that it progresses and uh, so that the money that is provided and the facility that is, is built uh, we can engage a, as much local uh, industry as possible and locals uh, in terms of employment. But again, those are arrangements that the Papua New Guinea government have to work through uh, to, to have it, but it is progressing. 
Yeah, I, we're seeing our defence force much more, much more visible now in our lives, particularly with COVID, where the army has been brought in on occasion as well as we try to impose greater restrictions, greater lockdown on people. We saw it during the bushfires as well. Can you talk about that and the ongoing role of our military and what are domestic emergencies? Yeah. Well, I think it's safe to say that the Australian Defence Force has had a very busy 12 months. Uh, they started before it became Oper Operation Bushfire Assist, sort of in uh, late August, early September, really started providing assistance under the Defence Assistance to the Civil Community Program. Uh, to bushfires in Queensland and then sort of around uh, around the country, uh, Operation Bushfire Assist uh, after you know the, during the Black Summer actually became the largest domestic uh, humanitarian relief effort uh, by the ADF in our nation's history. It far outclipsed uh, Cyclone Tracy. So what it demonstrated to us is that uh, the capabilities that we have inherent in the ADF. Uh, can assist state and territory authorities, but again, we we cannot uh, have them impact ultimately on the main tasks that government give us. But that said, uh, the defence force rolled very successfully from Operation uh, Bushfire Assist with the deployment of six and a half thousand troops across uh, across the country into uh, what's now Operation COVID nineteen Assist. And we are providing uh, four lines of efforts to support the nation. First of all is in the health assistance, where you can see we've got uh, over 3,200 personnel in all states and territories uh, supplementing and supporting state and territory authorities. But we're also providing significant support uh, to our defence industry here in Australia to make sure that they can get through COVID-19 intact and largely on track uh, with the programs they're supporting. We are also, as I've said, uh, supporting regional nations with their COVID-19 response. But we still have 2,500 defence personnel uh, globally uh, in the Middle East and you know, across our region who are doing business as usual, you know, as much as, much as we can. So getting the balance right is very important. But the main observation and some of the lessons uh, that we've learnt, which we have reflected in the four structure plan, is that the ADF does need to enhance some of its capabilities in terms of its air and sea lift capabilities, uh, in terms of our deployable uh, engineering capabilities uh, and other, other things that we've identified, other logistical uh, equipment and support. So we're doing that. But Sam, can I just say one of the most wonderful things that came out of, of that for me, of the bushfire assist, is the absolute genuine and... and spontaneous and immediate outpouring of support uh, from, from around the world and from our regional friends. So we had, uh, you know, Papua New Guinea and Fijian uh, and Indonesian engineers out on the, the front line in our bushfire response uh, and recovery. Uh, and we also had Singaporean uh, troops and uh, aviation assets. So the fact that so many of our regional friends came to our aid when we both needed it uh, is is a sign of our great friendship and it is a two-way it is a genuine two-way friendship we're almost out of time we, we need to uh, bring this session to a close a little bit earlier today at 12 45 but uh, there's been a lot of, of i want to just finish on there's a lot of criticism of australia's special forces in afghanistan of course there are inquiries into that we've seen this in newspaper headlines and the culture there as well is there a is there a cultural issue that you've identified and a, and a need for cultural change? Well, Stan, there's two parts to that. First of all is the ongoing ex, you know, Inspector General uh, ADF inquiry uh, that uh, Justice Burriton is conducting and uh, that is uh, coming to a conclusion. Uh, so I think that will make some very significant uh, findings, uh, ones that I'm certain will make many Australians uncomfortable uh, and also you know, dismayed at. Um, so I think we do need to prepare ourselves for that. But I can say uh, that in the intervening years, uh, the Army and particularly our Special Forces have been doing a significant amount of self-reflection wow. on how some of these reported circumstances could have happened uh, and what needs to happen structurally and culturally to make sure that these uh these events do not happen again. So, that, that is un so un unquestionably work had to be done. 
uh, and the Chief of Defence Force and the Chief of Army have spoken about that publicly. Uh, but I would stress that I do not for a second think that those issues that will be reported on, uh, in, I mean, I haven't seen the report, but, um, you know, I think we've seen enough publicly to, to understand what might be in there, uh, that that in no way reflects on our, our current serving men and women, uh, both here and overseas, who are doing an extraordinary job uh, for our nation. So, yes, there clearly has been a problem. And uh, we, we wait now to see the outcome of Justice Burton's report and uh, CDF will... Uh, we'll speak more publicly about that after the release of the report. As you say, um, preparing ourselves for exactly what that what that tells us. We are sadly out of time. Um, thank you so much for being generous with your time today and being able to cover such a wide range of, of topics as well. It's, it's been a real pleasure, Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan, and thank you very much, Aspie, for the opportunity.